Well, as Brian mentioned, my name is Paul Holden. I'm a partner here at Moss Adams. I help lead our cost reimbursement and regulatory reporting practice. So in the nature of our work, we cross over Medicare, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, Oshpod, Medicare Advantage. We see these from multiple perspectives, both from the acute and post-acute space. So we'll be talking um, on various topics in depth um, in, uh, in addition to uh, what Alyssa will be covering um, on the regulatory and fee-for-service side as well. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thanks so much for um, having me and Paul for inviting me. This is my first time attending this conference. Um, my name is Alyssa Keefe. I work for the California Hospital Association. We represent more than about 400 hospitals and healthcare systems, as well as the post-acute care providers that are owned and operated by those systems. So can I have a show of hands for all my Californians? In, in, in? Great, great. Thanks for, for traveling um, today. Um, for those of you that have heard me talk before, some of this may be um, familiar. Um, but with everything going on in, in California with the, with the fires, I just wanted to personally extend um, my thoughts uh, to many of you who have, um, you, your patients, your communities, your families maybe have been affected by both those in uh, Southern as well as Northern uh, California. Um, and it's very top of mind for me at the moment because we are having daily meetings regarding um, all the challenges hospitals face um, in providing services uh, during times of crisis um, and ensuring that patient safety and quality is maintained. And at the same time, as patients are moved around and uh, sites of service change, uh, that we can be adequately reimbursed, um, which I think is an interesting, um, it, it is a, a challenging topic um, in light of some of the devastation in particular in paradise. Um, so with that, Paul and I have been talking a little bit about um, you know, from a provider perspective from CHA where I sit, a historical look back is literally like the last regulatory cycle. <laughs> um, my job at CHA is to really um, think uh, strategically going forward, but also reflect on, on what's happening right now and, and the impact on, on providers. So um, I just wanted to provide a couple of context slides, if we could get those up. Great. So. Oh. This is the first time I've had to like sit and do the slides, and this is kind of fun, and these lights are very bright. Um, so this, this is not new to you. Um, as we think about, we're going to talk about both uh, the trends in reimbursement, both on the fee-for-service and the Medicare Advantage side, um, both from the acute and the post-acute per care perspective, and we're really interested in ensuring um, that we hear from all of you, because where you, um, where you sit as a provider or, or supplier, et cetera, um, really, in, in your view of, of the, the trajectory that we're on, um, is, is something we're interested in hearing from you about. So it's not news to you that um, if you look at the nat national health care expenditures um, and Medicare spending, it's a huge share of the, of the federal budget. Um, and so I want to provide that as context as we go into kind of a historic and going forward, because um, we are going to be in an environment um, where we move now into, uh, uh, you know, where we're far more fiscally challenged um, in light of recent tax legislation. And what does that do um, when we are challenged in balancing the federal budget? Um, we look to entitlement programs, and we've seen that. It's historical. Um, big changes occur, um, and we have seen incremental changes as well as significant changes uh, happen to the Medicare program over time. Um, and, and one of the, the depending on kind of where, where you are on the uh, spectrum as a provider, when I think about fee-for-service, really, um, what do you think the current state of Medicare fee-for-service or Medicare reimbursement is in general, right? And I think this really varies based on where you are in the country. Um, for a state like California that's dominated by managed care, we have a fairly significant um, uh, and efficient uh, market, but we're still challenged in our costs, uh, in particular because of the high regulatory burden in California, seismic compliance, emergency preparedness, and all those other costs that are not necessarily built into our fee-for-service systems. Um, so those uh, trajectories and trends um, really do have an impact on kind of, in particular, my view and our provider's view of, of fee-for-service um, uh, spending. And so, uh, but if you're in the state of Alabama or in another state where it's dominated by fee for service, your uh, perspectives may be uh, slightly different. So I'm just going to share kind of ours, but we're really interested in, in hearing your perspective. 
Uh, so it's not news as well that Medicare fee-for-service has undergone significant changes over the last 20 years um, in particular. Um, these are not necessarily uh, things that are news to you. Um, we have, uh, you know, significant change since uh, the Affordable Care Act as we drove uh, from volume to value, and that, that journey continues. That's a marathon, not a sprint. And we've certainly seen some bumps in the road. Uh, but at the same time, we've also seen um, things like coding offsets um, and rebasing, and we have seen um, changes uh, in this payment system as we struggle to pay for new technologies and the rising cost of drugs. So the Medicare fee-for-service, whether acute or post-acute, has been, has been challenged in really um, trying to pay adequately for, for those services. At the same time, you have all the other trends that um, are, are additional pressures. Again, the change in the population, the aging of the baby boomers, et cetera. I'm going to focus on a couple um, today that I think give us um, a little bit of perspective of the trajectory and share our, our thoughts from an industry perspective. Um, but I think it is important to keep in mind that as we have all these external disruptors, um, um, and we also have this drive towards uh, from value, from volume to value. We certainly, Medicare fee for service is the underpinnings for some of the medic, for all of the Medicare alternative payment models. So as these challenges and trends continue in fee for service, they have ripple effects through um, the changes that we are seeing in alternative payment models that were kind of um, talked to earlier in, in the day today. Yeah, and, and that uh, that brings up an interesting point as Alyssa continues to talk about the evolution for those folks who may not be aware. In the Social Security Act, when the prospective payment models were enacted, CMS's mandate was that they could only change payment rates prospectively. They could only take historical data and make changes into the future. That's why they had to create entities like RACs and ZPICs and others to go and retrospectively recoup dollars uh, if there was an overpayment. So you see CMS tinkering with their programs going forward because they're trying to adjust for overpayments or unintended consequences that were enacted through rulemaking. Absolutely. Um, and so we, we've seen a couple of different approaches to that tinkering um, over time. And um, in particular, we have seen two different approaches from my perspective, the acute side um, of, of some tinkering and then the post-acute side. Um, and both Congre Congress um, and the administrations um, have taken uh, some uh, different approaches. Um, in particular, on the slide that I was going to show up here, this is the timing's a little. Thank you. OK, so um, one of the things I wanted to talk to um, in particular is this evolve evolution of site neutral payments. And I know um, that word is used all the time, and it confuses providers quite a bit. Um, but site neutral payment is not necessarily new. Um, and it has taken a couple of different approaches in the fee for service system. Uh, both on the acute or the post-acute side. Uh, and for those of you nerdy policy wonks that sit and read MedPAC reports or um, you attend those meetings like, like I do, these uh, issues and, and, and these policies have been around, around since the Bush administration um, and even longer before that. Um, there have been recommendations to tinker with the fee-for-service system, in particular on the ambulatory side, um, to ensure that Medicare pays for the service um, regardless of the site in which it's provided. And so we've seen that, again, from MedPAC, um, just as recently as just this June. Um, they are seeing uh, an evolution in, in um, uh, we are seeing more provider-based led emergency departments in states like Texas and Colorado. Um, there's a concern about freestanding emergency departments. Um, and so MedPAC just in June made a recommendation about lowering those um, uh, those payments for those freestanding uh, because they're quite concerned about um, uh, the, 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 the number of them that are popping up and the increased costs um, uh, to the Medicare trust aid, uh, uh, Part A trust fund. Um, but of course, we've seen site neutral payment policies um, tinkering with fee for service every time. Um, we try and balance the federal budget. Um, but most in particular, I, we're also seeing it play out at the state level. And for those of you that have, uh, are from the state of California, you may recall in 2016 in the assembly, uh, we had a bill that in, was introduced that suggested uh, and mandated that hospitals, if you had a provider 
uh, based entity, you could no longer charge uh, the enhanced facility, not the enhanced, but the facility fee. So essentially creating site neutral between the ambulatory and outpatient uh, setting. Uh, but we also saw uh, site neutral payment policy in post acute care uh, back in 2013 with the establishment of uh, site neutral payment policies for long term acute care hospitals between uh, that uh, payment for those stays, uh, kind of equivalent to the inpatient prospective payment system. So these types of tweaks um, have again been cost savers uh, to the Medicare Part A program and really built on um, uh, some of the underlying principles that, again, on the acute side that you're paying for um, the, the service, not necessarily a setting. And where we're seeing it really um, come up is in the commercial setting. So many of you are familiar with the Anthem imaging policies that would have not paid uh, a higher rate for um, provider uh, based uh, imaging services, uh, and, and again, we're seeing that kind of a trend in, in many of the commercial plans and trying to uh, steer their patients to the lower cost setting. So there have been two approaches in site neutral. Um, again, tinkering with the Medicare fee for service. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, two in particular on the acute care because I think it's most relevant and it certainly was a game changer in this regulatory cycle. Um, with the enactment of Section 603 of the Balanced Budget Act of 2015. But we've also seen a very different approach on the post-acute care, which really started in large part when, when Congress enacted the Impact Act of 2014. So we have two very different approaches to tinkering with the PPS systems in light of growing expenditures. Um, and uh, I think providers are really wrestling with that uh, in particular. So let me just dive into Section 603 for those of you that don't live and breathe it every day like I do. Um, but this has been uh, an area where there has been continued um, concerns um, regarding in uh, not having equitable payments between a physician office and an outpatient setting on something that uh, is as simple as a, a clinic visit. Um, we have seen in the Medicare program increased expenditures in acute and post-acute care. So when you see those increased expenditures, because we have an aging Medicare population, we look for different ways to curb uh, that spending. So there has been a desire by many to base payment on patient acuity um, or a specific service rather than uh, the site of care. And that has really come about because of many of these fiscal pressures. But in particular on Section 603, there's a perception um, and that, that this legislation in particular would curb the predatory provider practices of pr purchasing those physician offices um, and flipping them to uh, hospital outpatient departments. Um, and we'll talk about kind of that, um, that perception and, and, and some of the challenges that we as providers face in that. So in particular, and this is a pretty California-specific slide, um, you know, one of the challenges in Medicare fee-for-service is that we have a lot of, as I mentioned, additional built-in costs in each of these siloed payment systems. So in a hospital outpatient department that's paid under the outpatient PPS, um, you know, we take all patients as provider-based outpatient departments. Um, we, uh, our ED patients and our ED uh, services are tied to OPPS, so we're open 24-7. In California, we have a particularly high cost uh, regulatory market uh, that requires seismic compliance. So if you're going to have an off-campus provider-based outpatient department, it has to be seismically compliant with the outpatient standards. Uh, by 2020 or 2030, depending on your trajectory. So our story on the site neutral, um, as you've probably seen played out in the trade press, um, or if you're, you're on the provider perspective, is that you know, we're trying to differenti differentiate ourselves um, and, and that, that that differentiation does, does uh, deliver value. Uh, in particular, when uh, you are proposing to pay us at the equivalent of a physician office, uh, setting payment. And, and so that's been a, a real challenge, I think, for, for providers who are, are struggling with negative Medicare margins anyway on the outpatient side to then also consider this, um, this site neutral value, but the site neutral payment. The challenge, though, also is um, it, it's not just the, the perception of the 
predatory practice of uh, buying up physician offices and converting them, it is also about the, the patient and the inequitable um, outpatient or co-patient and co-insurance and deductibles that are that a patient, a Medicare patient, would pay for this same service. So the administration and CMS's perspective really has been that we don't want to have beneficiaries going in one door of a medical office building and have one co-insurance and deductible and going into another door uh, and having another. However, whether or not changing the payment system is the most appropriate approach in light of the fundamental underpinning of how these costs are rolled up to pay for these services in each of these systems, I think remains to be um, where we have our concerns. Uh, in addition, um, you know, we, there are studies that show that uh, many of these outpatient um, uh, departments, from our perspective, are serving a very different patient population, um, and they are essential in our rural communities. This is one of the ways in which we provide services in our rural communities. So it's been a really a challenging issue, um, and one that is, is really difficult um, at a legislative and policy front, because you can kind of see both sides of the equation, and then the dollars that are tied to this for site neutral um, are, are not insignificant. Um, and so you have MedPAC and uh, folks like the Site Neutral Coalition and others that are really pushing policymakers to see this as a cost saver um, with, from our perspective, not really recognizing some of the fundamental um, underlying issues in the fee-for-service system. Yep, absolutely. And, and one point quickly on when we're talking about APC reimbursement, uh, in Medicare's rulemaking for OPPS, when Medicare calculates the cost and the weightings for APC payments, which are those ambulatory payment classifications, they are actually taking all of your line items on the Medicare cost report and multiplying straight across on the Part B crosswalk in order to estimate what Medicare's share of cost is. So as a provider, if you've gone through the exercise and all of the checklists to make sure you, those clinics are provider-based, making sure that they are properly reported on your Medicare cost report so that when you compare your calculated Medicare costs to your APC payments and you're seeing that shortfall in reimbursement, you need that transparency in those calculations to be able to communicate back to Alyssa and other advocates, look at this shortfall. This is where we are having to absorb and cost shift on our end due to a deficiency uh, in reimbursement in certain areas. So making sure that you're following all of those mechanisms to properly calculate and reflect cost is imperative going forward. Right. Absolutely. So in light of some of these trends and, and um, concerns, Congress did act. Um, and they implemented, um, as part of the Balanced Budget Act of 2018, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, Section 603 of the BBA, it mandated site-neutral payment for non-ED services in new off-campus provider-based departments. Um, so um, this is something that was, has been in the President's budgets for years. We knew it was coming. Um, it, but, it, but in Congress, in, in our view, recognized that this was a go-forward policy, right? So if you opened on or after November 15th, um, you know, you would be uh, provided a, a new uh, physician equivalent rate. Um, and CMS recognized um, in rulemaking that it's very difficult for hospitals to bill uh, under the physician uh, fee schedule. Like we don't, we don't actually use those claims. We use the UBs, um, and so the, through rulemaking, um, in in order to pay us uh, at this new rate, they did implement kind of a percentage of your OPPS rates. So again, it was a very narrow provision. Uh, that, a, that really targeted um, what they believed to be uh, a real concern uh, of kind of the proliferation of provider-based off-campus departments. We would perceive it as reaching into our communities and providing services that are needed and integrating with our physicians. Congress had another um, uh, perspective and continues to implement this uh, through rulemaking. We did have um, some adjustments in the 21st Century Cures Act that allowed some of those uh, folks that were mid-billed to continue to pay, uh, get their full OPPS rates for a year or so. Uh, some of them, um, and then, uh, or continue to open and then continue to get their full OPPS rates. So what we saw differently, though, in, in this year's rulemaking was, again, so we've, we're now, we were two years into this policy. Um, 
Basically, Congress said to CMS, you need to implement this law that says if you're off campus and you're off hospital outpatient department that's provider-based, you're going to get this new equivalent rate. Um, and in doing so, um, we're going to monitor kind of the growth of those services. Um, so in previous rulemaking, they said, you know, we're not really going to worry too much, but we're going to monitor whether or not these services are growing. Um, and but we'll we'll pay you at these these reduced uh, rates. What CMS did in this year's rulemaking um, was and has been a long-standing administration proposal is to continue in fee-for-service to drive site-neutral policies. And so while this law said, if you opened after November 15th, you get a reduced rate, anybody that was already open, you still get your outpatient rates. Um, what they basically said is, actually for clinic visits, that G0463 or 48, Larry will correct me, um, but for clinic visits, um, regardless of whether or not they were open on or after, that clinic was open on or after November 15th, we're going to apply this reduced rate because they wanted to advance this site-neutral payment policy. Because again, if you go in one door, you uh, would want to be paid at OPPS, uh, you would want to have the same as the patient, the coinsurance or deductible versus, versus uh, going into a hospital, out, uh, a physician office. Uh, when <laughs> I think, um, let me just skip ahead because I think what is most concerning about this, this policy is that CMS, this is what makes it a game changer. So Congress basically said that um, we're going to protect these grandfathered clinics. Uh, and CMS said in this rule, actually, no, <laughs> we're not. Um, also, Congress said when we enact this lower payment rate, we'll do it in a budget-neutral manner, which basically means it's budget-neutral to the payment system. And so if we were taking money away from uh, these clinics, that it's kind of spread across everyone else. The new section of the statute that CMS drew upon to implement this uh, for, the grand, for, the, the non uh, for the grandfathered clinics was a provision in the Social Security Act that says if you have incre if, if CMS is seeing increased volume or expenditures of outpatient services, they can essentially take action to curb those expenditures. Um, usually, when CMS is tinkering with a PPS, and uh, they usually will use things, especially in the outpatient, they'll use tools like packaging and, and making the outpatient system a lot more like a fee-for-service system rather than a fee schedule. And they will look at different levers. And they will also use, they have done it in the past, looking back, they've done it in a budget neutral way. But this administration advanced this section of the Social Security Act and proposed this in a non-budget neutral manner. Um, and so they, they essentially went beyond what we believed was Congress's intent. And this, from our perspective, is kind of the slippery slope to site neutral across all the ambulatory settings. Uh, for outpatient. And this is where I think providers are very concerned, because it's no longer about Congress taking action. It was the administration looking to the statute um, and suggesting that they have authority to now pay site-neutral equivalent for services, and they picked limiting it to off-campus provider-based departments, and they limited it to one service. Um, I think a lot of providers were really caught by surprise. Um, I think we all knew that, that under Section 603, if you expanded your services, we, we recognized, we anticipated 340B would also be included. But I think pulling on this section of the statute was certainly a game changer for a lot of hospitals. And a lot of hospitals in California that had a network of provider-based clinics serving primarily um, large populations of Medicare beneficiaries, as well as really rural parts of our state, we're very concerned, and we're concerned about this trajectory. Um, and so, in just wrapping up on the acute side, this, this particular um, provision uh, is, is a trend, I think. And I think going forward, we're going to see more of this, because the, the ideas are out there. MedPAC has the ideas we're seeing in, in the commercial setting. And now Congress for the first, I'm sorry, and the administration has now cited a, a place in, in the Social Security Act where they believe they have the, the statutory authority 
to move this ahead um, in the outpatient setting. And so I think um, if, if we do not see a rollback of this either through litigation, which I expect will be filed by next week by our National Association colleagues, um, that this could be the slippery slope to more equivalent um, uh, site neutral payments between the ambulatory side as well as the outpatient side. Absolutely. And I feel like you and I probably made that face when we saw all 4,200 pages of rule <laughs> right. that was issued. Right, absolutely. It was, um, I think we were, uh, I, I know many of you were probably as concerned as, as we were about the, the scope and the expansion of it. Um, but it is, it, it's a, a known issue um, that we know the administration and Congress has been concerned about and will continue to, to push back again because we believe from an industry perspective um, that there is uh, a fundamental disregard for the other inherent costs that are built into that outpatient system and we, we want to preserve those. Um, on the flip side, it's a, been a very different approach from my perspective on post-acute. Um, we had, again, bipartisan, uh, we have a, a trajectory here that is not news to you. We have increasing health care expenditures in the post-acute side, and we have far higher margins on the post-acute side, uh, Medicare margins, than we do on the acute side. Um, and so the challenges here, um, or the goals here, have been um, an approach by Congress in the IMPACT Act to pay based on clinical acuity, functional status, um, and really, they laid the groundwork um, to revise the patient assessment tools uh, so that they'd have the data, so that they could build up a new PPS that, again, pays on patient acuity and characteristics rather than site of care. It's a very different approach than just picking a service line and adjusting the payment from our perspective. Um, but I know as post-acute care providers, you all are feeling like you're drinking from the fire hose. Every time you turn around, um, there are tweaks to your payment systems. Um, and I'm just going to talk about them at a very high level because I think they are on this trajectory of uh, unified PPS. Uh, in particular, the um, Impact Act set forward kind of a goal um, to have a unified post-acute care payment system uh, by 2023. Uh, and, but it would take an act of Congress, obviously, to implement it. But it really did fundamentally lay the groundwork for data collection to build this new PPS. Um, and at the same time, there have been all these other MedPAC recommendations about tweak the current PPSs so that they do more adequately pay for uh, patient acuity and characteristics, uh, lower the regulatory burden of these sites, sites so we can have a seamless care transition, which, which makes sense. Um, but the, what we saw this year was the first time that the president's budget actually put a unified PPS into their budget, and they accelerated that change um, from my perspective in rulemaking. So a lot of these things had been out there, had been talked about, but we hadn't really seen them play out in rulemaking um, before. And so the trajectory really played out this year where we had significant changes in home health, SNF, ERF and LTAC, either as a result of Congre Congress tweaking the payment systems uh, or, uh, uh, you know, CMS taking a step forward. Um, and, and in particular, I'll, I'll talk about ERF and maybe you want to talk about SNF, but yeah. um, when the Impact Act uh, was implemented and we began um, data collection of standardized data elements. So everybody collect the same data across all the post-acute care settings so you could roll it up and build a PPS. Um, and so everybody remembers section GG, those functional status um, uh, measures. They were used for quality uh, reporting uh, and they were implemented across the IRFPI, the MDS, the care tool, etc. Well, the, the Earth payment system really largely pays on functional status, and they had their own scale. It's the FIM scale. Um, and the second that CMS implemented Section GG of the, the rule, it was the writing was on the wall for Earth providers that eventually you would assume that as, if we're on this trajectory to a unified PPS, um, that the FIM score may go away. And I will tell you, I sit on a board every month with our post-acute care providers, and they'd say, Alyssa, are they really going to do that? Are they really going to do that? I said, yes. Yes, they're going to do that. So make sure that you're you know, dual reporting, you're doing it correctly. Um, because we do believe that they were going to, and that's what they did. They proposed um, to remove the FIM 
um, uh, scale from the RFPPS and rejigger the um, CMGs for payment, and they will implement that um, in 2020, despite overwhelming industry um, uh, pushback. Uh, and the lack of available data to even um, determine whether or not CMS contractors created the case mix and, and the weights appropriately for the CMGs. Um, and this is a very different approach to what they did in SNFs, which SNFs had five years and five technical expert panels looking at changes uh, to the SNF uh, PPS system. I think folks were anticipating, um, and MedPAC had anticipated um, uh, and, and proposed changes for the SNF PPS, again, to drive uh, the payments for SNF patients for the clinically complex where they had been dominated um, by the therapy rugs. So that writing had kind of been on the, on the wall. And you, if you put the two technical <coughs> reports side by side for CMS, you had one that was like hundreds of pages longer for SNF <laughs> than you did for ERF. And then you didn't actually have the data um, on either side to replicate either methodology. Um, so I feel as though, from my perspective on those two payment systems, uh, this year's rulemaking, we just took a giant step forward on this trajectory towards the unified PPS. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because we have individuals in the room from the entire spectrum of care, when we're talking about this change with the patient-driven payment model, this is an enormous opportunity for acute and post-acute providers to be working in unison. The way that the PDPM came together is CMS saw under the RUG4 model that all of that information in the minimum data set was setting an expectation for a stroke patient, cardiovascular, whatever condition it was, and they were getting paid a consistent amount over the course of their stay. But when CMS was coupling the reimbursement information with the demographic information, it didn't appear that those beneficiaries were getting better over that time period. And so when the OIG and others went in to look at that data, they say, well, why are we paying so much if people aren't getting healthier, if they aren't transitioning to a different uh, mode of care, home health, they're being discharged to home. So when you're looking at this PDPM, CMS now has said, when you are discharged from an acute to post-acute space, you need to set a baseline for your clinical category. It's an orthopedic, it's a stroke, it's a cardiovascular. Then what CMS is gonna do is through continual monitoring, they are going to begin to taper reimbursement over the course of the stay to align with the acuity and the wellness of that beneficiary. So you can imagine in that baton pass, if you have not calibrated medication reconciliation, if the patient didn't know that they were in observation for three days as opposed to a qualifying inpatient stay, all of those handoffs and communication points between the discharge planners in the acute space and those receiving the patients in the sniff space, that transition has to be seamless and extremely well coordinated. And it's an opportunity, especially for those freestanding skilled nursing facilities and those acute care providers in urban and other markets to really come together and make sure that both entities are receiving adequate reimbursement. Right, absolutely. I think um, home health and LTAC, you were not um, saved from this trajectory either. Uh, we saw a continuation of some of the site neutral payment policies um, in LTACs, and then a fundamental redesign of the home health PPS. Um, again, CMS taking very bold steps um, to re redo the case mix index. Some of this is, um, ha they haven't been touched in a long time, right? And, and so there, some of this has been in the works. Congress intervened in particular on the home health agents, uh, agency PPS um, to ensure that CMS did do it in a budget neutral way because they, they proposed it as not budget neutral. Um, so big changes coming um, down in the, in, again, in the fee for service system. And that has a lot of uh, implications. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, and, and Paul's going to talk about uh, the MA side, um, but everything stems from um, fee-for-service, right, from my perspective, <laughs> um, because while so many of our hospitals are still taking risk, um, they are still either um, largely tied to some of these uh, fee-for-service uh, policies and mechanisms. Um, but these these fundamental changes uh, in post-acute care are going to have both upstream and downstream impacts from our perspective um, that are going to put, again, increasing pressures on the, on the hospital uh, side as well as those post-acute care provisor, 
providers. There is, however, I think also an opportunity for hospitals and health systems um, who have these distinct part units and others um, to take advantage of some of the changes that, uh, for in particular, I know that um, the PDPM model for SNFs will be largely advantageous likely to those hospital-based SNFs, of which we have a number of them um, in California. But there are going to be huge resource and operational constraints. Disruption, um, you all remember uh, Ken was saying earlier how much variation there is in post-acute care spending. There's tremendous variation. That's where everybody is seeing in the, the opportunities under these alternative payment models in Medicare. But we have now just fundamentally turned those PPSs about on, you know, on their heads, and that's going to have downstream impacts for those target prices uh, for those providers that are engaged in those alternative payment models, and we need to think that through. Um, so again, huge changes that are going to coincide with the rollout of all these new patient um, assessment data elements in your IRFPI, your SNF, the OASIS and the CARE tool. Um, did I say MDS? Uh, those are all slated to probably come online in 2020. At the same time, you're going to have all these PPS changes. So again, as post-acute care providers are um, struggling with all of those that are going to hit at the same time, I think we're going to see some significant behavioral um, changes in the market that both uh, uh, post-acute and, uh, post and acute providers are going to have to struggle with together. So with that, I'm going to turn it. Oh. Oh, a concluding slide, right? In fee-for-service, um, you know, the train's not slowing down on these types of policies. As I said, um, sitting down with uh, administration um, officials earlier this year, they made the point to say to me, you saw our budget, right? You know what we're, what we're aiming towards. Um, and, and, and MedPAC is right behind them with additional support for these changes um, in fee-for-service and continues uh, to uh, accelerate their recommendation, their pace of their recommendations with the new chairman. Um, so hospitals and post-acute care providers are really struggling under the fee-for-service um, to fight, switch, integrate, partner, which I think folks talked about um, earlier in the session, but how to navigate the uncertainty and kind of anticipating what comes next, because it is still a significant portion of their revenue. Um, it is still a, um, something that they want to continue to try and think through, because if you can manage that population, you can take the learnings and apply it to a Medicare Advantage or an mo alternative payment model, especially if you're one of those uh, providers that is still being you know, paid on the, on the pricer and perhaps not taking as much risk. So with that, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. So as we begin to evolve into this, this new evolution of Medicare, Medicare is no longer just Medicare. We have two pieces to the puzzle. Uh, thanks to our friends at the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, for this, this slide. Uh, what we have here is the evolution of Medicare Advantage enrollment going back to the early 90s. Now, for those folks who were involved in Med Advantage and other risk-based contracts in the 90s, things didn't work out so well. And we'll talk about why and what is actually different going forward. Uh, it was also very helpful to see that over this transition, we've had three significant iterations to the Medicare fee-for-service program during that time period. Now, this slide ended in 2014, but what I wanted to show by superimposing a separate slide that we had on enrollment is the trend is not slowing down. As of 2017, we're now at one-third enrollment on the Medicare Advantage side. So I want you to keep in mind this trajectory of enrollment when we go through the next couple of slides. It'll be very important from a context perspective. When we break down those enrollees, you can see the distribution between those individuals who are in group plans and those individuals who are in individual Medicare Advantage plans. And as Ken pointed out, 50% of new plans coming online have a provider spin or a provider involvement role uh, in them. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. Uh, through uh, the help of Google, and Google is, is just so powerful that it's now in the, the dictionary as an adjective. Um, we have a slide here that I found uh, from Healthcare Financing Review in the winter of 1996. 
This was the Medicare Advantage percentages nationwide in 1996. And you can see, to no surprise to many in the audience, I'm sure, we had a West Coast predominance of, of Medicare managed care back even in the mid-90s. Now at the bottom here, you can see in the box that I uh, highlighted in red, only 10.7% of enrollees back in 1995 were in Advantage plans. And you can see the distribution across the country going between 5 and 38.2%. Now let's fast forward to 2016. We're now at 31%, headed toward 33 as of 2017. Look at the change in enrollment percentages nationwide coupled with the growth from 3 million to 19 million Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare Advantage is very real. It's not an equal distribution across the country, and it's a very different population from their Medicare Part A predecessors. So I wanted to give you context uh, in that framework. My colleague Carl Rebe and I received a question at a presentation last week about, well, is Medicare Advantage just sort of concentrated in one area? And the answer, as you can see, is no. The, the more interesting fact in terms of the concentration is that the type of contracts that Advantage plans negotiate are very different nationwide as well between capitation and fee-for-service. What I wanted to talk about in terms of Medicare Advantage is I went out to CMS's website and for the DRG-based Part A discharges within the federal fiscal year 2019 rulemaking, I sorted these conditions from largest to smallest based on DRGs by total number of discharges. The number one condition continues to be septicemia, and you can see the other conditions here. These are the top 10. The interesting thing is not only are these conditions, these are conditions with either complications and comorbidity or multiple complications and comorbidity. So these are Medicare Part A beneficiaries who are driving these diagnoses and conditions. The interesting thing is that when you look at the Part C enrollment, this is a very different population of Medicare. These are 65-year-olds predominantly who are seeing Medicare Advantage look and feel very similar to the commercial coverage they had when they were employed. I know a handful of 65-year-olds who ran half marathons in the last six months. It's a different population of weekend warrior type orthopedic and other condition population. Now that's not to say that, there are, that everybody on Part C is different than Part A, it's just the trend is moving into a different direction. One of the most important things to keep in mind, and we'll go through uh, these bullet points um, as we begin to close out the presentation because each are so important to the discussion. One, in most Western states, especially in Oregon and others, enrollment is outpacing Part A three to one. Why is that important? When Medicare, through their IPPS rulemaking every year, calculates their DRG weights and their market basket updates, they take Medicare Part C claims and they throw them out. Throw them out, they just put them off to the side. The, the interesting thing about that is now you have a population of Part A beneficiaries who are driving the calculations that are demonstrating Medicare's share of cost. Well, as we know, those Medicare Part C plans that aren't capitated generally negotiate on some multiple of A. Well, we just saw the conditions that Part A beneficiaries are incurring uh, and re receiving treatment for. They are driving a very different cost model that Medicare Part C is picking up and applying to their conditions as well. So that's why it's so important to understand that these are two very different populations that are actually receiving care in your facility simultaneously, where the Part A population is a more reactive to regulatory policy population, but your Part C folks, you're in the driver's seat in a lot of situations where you can use internal data, claims data, other data points to aggressively negotiate those Part C contracts. So Medicare is no longer Medicare. One of the interesting things, certainly for those individuals who are cost-based reimbursed, Part C does not make you whole to cost. 
So in your marketplace, if your Part C population is receiving the same conditions and the same treatment as Part A, you're not being made whole for that piece of the pie. So very important um, uh, to, uh, uh, to consider. Paying a close attention to payer contracting is absolutely paramount, especially on the physician credentialing side. We've seen a lot of uh, rural providers and others who are struggling to get physicians into their marketplace. They get them there and all of a sudden realize it's a six month lag to get them um, board certified, licensed, in the door, and actually being able to bill for care. So making sure that payer contracting and physician credentialing on your advantage and other payers, that all of that is working in lockstep to make sure that there's no lag in terms of cash flow. Cost containment in this scenario and many others is absolutely paramount. In the 90s, when a lot of individuals were calculating PMPM type contracts, they were using actuaries to do retrospective cost calculations without really understanding their patient population. You individuals in the audience who are negotiating capitated arrangements, it is a whole new ball game. You have claims information, you have costing detail, you have Epic and Cerner and other systems that give you a lens into those individuals who are re receiving care in your facility. Don't use cost as a basis for negotiating a contract. Use the conditions and the demographics of your population to aggressively move forward into this marketplace because as we saw with that initial slide, the trend is not slowing down. So something to be very aware of. So with that, um, we have about 10 minutes, but before we move to questions, I'd love to pass it back to you because California in the med advantage space is such a unique uh, marketplace. I'd love to just get your thoughts on this as well. Sure. So. <laughs> We could divide the state of California into three separate states if we wanted to, because the markets can be very, very different, depending. Um, so I think uh, if you juxtapose the LA market uh, to Northern California, um, you know, they're very different. And so, for example, we have significant large uh, physician groups uh, that take capitation and then do uh, the contracting with the providers kind of taking, with the hospitals taking on the risk. Um, and, and therefore, not as much, perhaps, uh, for some of the independent hospitals, uh, as much experience um, with MA and kind of that type of aggressive uh, contracting. I know that a lot of them, um, and I, when I talk to them about CMS alternative payment models, they really wanted to dip their toe um, into things like ACOs, next gen ACOs, pioneer ACOs, to see if it would help them on their MA strategies, right? Um, but I think your point is well taken that um, it depends on how you're looking at the data, right, and how these, um, these models are constructed. Um, and, and whether or not that really is helpful to a provider in thinking through their next steps and stages uh, with MA. Um, and, and so, and, and again, when I talk to a lot of um, my providers that are working with their Medicare Advantage plans, it is very varied. Um, we have a significant proportion of, of hospitals that are basically being paid on the pricer. So even under their MA uh, contracts, it's based on the fee-for-service payments, which is um, challenging when you're seeing your dish payments drop or these additional site-neutral policies uh, come into play. And then lastly, on the post-acute side, when Ken said it earlier, everyone hears that, you know, um, um, you, that MA plans just aren't paying for uh, each level of care in post-acute, I hear that quite a bit. Um, and so I actually spent a lot of my time uh, reminding health plans in California about um, uh, Medicare uh, criteria for LTAX, ERF, uh, and ERF care in particular uh, now. Um, you know, the, the most recent fires, we have lost over 300 post-acute care beds in the state of California. Um, and so that's, that's a huge, huge blow um, to, to the healthcare marketplace. Um, and, and we are struggling as providers um, to transfer patients to a lower level of care where we may not have um, uh, some of those um, post-acute care providers available now uh, to take them, which would require beneficiaries traveling very significant long distances. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting is when you see the policies and changes that Alyssa shared, you can look at fee-for-service as CMS making an intention to move that to sort of advantage light. 
really trying to move it more toward those bundled payments and other value-based purchasing programs. The interesting thing is we hear a lot of dialogue from orthopedic surgeons and organizations who are participating in comprehensive joint replacement and other programs where while the patient may benefit to move out to home health or to a skilled nursing setting, the physician leaders are on the hook for any cost savings that's achieved. They don't want those patients leaving their clinical pathway because if they come back, the cost constraint is still on themselves. Mm -hmm. So getting everybody to work in unison is, is very important. So um, with that, we can certainly open it up to uh, uh, questions from the audience. Oh, we should ask. We, we're really interested now that you've heard all of this, what your view yes. of Medicare reimbursement is going forward. So we shared our perspectives, and so maybe not a question, but maybe you have a comment or insights or maybe another trend or trajectory that you're, you're also seeing. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, thanks, you guys. Uh, Carl from Moss Adams. Um, I, my question is for you, Alyssa. Uh, what's the, what are you guys doing as far as um, maybe assisting your constituents in analyzing the capabilities under CAP as a way to maybe stem some of these cuts and, and deal with the problems on the reimbursement side? So um, the role of the California Hospital Association is advocacy. So I write a lot of comment letters and I spend a lot of time in Baltimore making friends and influencing people. <laughs> um, my colleague is obviously um, working the, our congressional delegation um, as well. I think um, we leave um, some of the, the trends analysis and the data aggregation um, to many of you in this room, uh, the experts in uh, the data analytics to assist uh, providers. From our perspective, we are really trying to make, you, make our, our hospitals, health systems, and post-acute care providers aware of the trends and the trajectory and where Congress may or may not go, where this administration may, may, may or may not go. Um, and engage them in thinking proactively. Um, uh, but I think there is a, uh, and I think we're also thinking, you know, 10 years out, right? I think we're also trying to um, and think through for our providers, you know, what is the impact of the Amazons um, and all the things, all the other disruptors and things that are happening in the marketplace um, that are also coming. So it's not just the imaging um, policy from Aetna. That, that's today, right? We're, we're also trying to make them very aware of all the things that we talked about in the last session and these larger trends and how do we um, collectively think about um, what, what is the definition um, of the services we will be providing? How do we pay for those things that are not necessarily um, addressed explicitly, um, for example, 24-7 emergency, emergency preparedness, um, all the things that we're asked to do that are not necessarily um, paid for in our current uh, structures, which is why we have the cost shift, um, et cetera. So uh, from that perspective, trying to um, play defense at the same time we're playing offense, um, which can really be a challenge on a day-to-day, on -day, and you guys probably know that better than anyone because you're, you're having to do, do that um, uh, as well every day in your own organizations. Any other questions? Sure, I've got one. Um, you know, and Paul and Alyssa, you guys did a great job of uh, outlining the that skateboard image and the continuing reduction of off-campus uh, Medicare reimbursement. From uh, from what you're hearing from your clients, Paul and the members, Alyssa, how are the hospitals reacting or responding to these changes? What are you seeing uh, on the ground? Do you want to start? Yeah, well, it, it's very interesting. Uh, Provider-based, whether on or off campus. Um, has been a unique animal. I, we have actually seen, a, especially in Western states, a predominance of providers actually just saying, I don't want any more nasty phone calls to my business office. The beneficiaries are complaining about two co-insurance amounts. We're just gonna go to freestanding and we'll deal with the downstream effect later. I think one thing that we are seeing for those individuals who had off-campus primary care services that fell under the G-code that Alyssa mentioned is that they are trying to figure out a way to move those primary care services back on campus 
while taking on-campus provider-based services and moving them into an off-campus location to mitigate the offset. So even as early as late summer, uh, when this outpatient reduction was proposed, we saw a lot of providers taking immediate action to really understand their operations. So uh, to, your, to your question, Larry, we're definitely seeing individuals not just sit back and let it happen, they are trying to take a much more proactive approach. So in California, um, I will tell you, I have about 330 PPS hospitals. And this particular expansion of site neutral policy under the outpatient rule only impacted about 40 hospitals. Uh, but it was a significant, about $42 million. It's not, it's not insignificant because the, who it affected were our rural, independent, um, owned hospitals. Um, so the challenge in California um, because these are costly. It's, it, going in and flipping an MOB into an HOPD in California is not cheap. You have to retrofit that building for seismic compliance. I mean, it, it, it's incredibly expensive to do. Um, and we have, um, uh, we often do it in rural settings because that's how we keep our physicians there who cannot um, maintain the, 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 the independent private practice that the meaningful use requirements or other regulatory burdens or et cetera. They really want to partner with their hospitals. And so I think the California story has been a little bit um, different. I don't know that we have been as impacted, but I think what I'm hearing from providers is that this, this call out of this new piece of the statute is very, very concerning to them because they are very concerned about the, um, the kind of fundamental um, erosion of OPPS payments in general. Um, so it wasn't about that they couldn't go and do these things off campus. It was, um, hold on a second, that provision in the Social Security Act is not limited to just um, on and off campus. It is all outpatient services. And so I think from our perspective, that's why my comments were quite visceral. Um, I used a lot of adjectives. I try to stay pretty low key, but I definitely turned it up on that letter. Um, and, and unfortunately, we weren't um, successful. Um, but I think we'll be looking um, for other uh, means by which to push back, because we don't believe that the agency put forward the appropriate evidence to advance such a policy, and so I think we're going to be pushing back. And they, that's what we're hearing from providers, is that, um, that, that there isn't sufficient evidence to demonstrate, um, and, and quite frankly, they don't believe that, that they have the legal authority to do that, um, in particular when Congress kind of set these provider-based clinics um, kind of off to the side uh, and protected a number of them. So um, based on how it was impacting and who it impacted, um, that was, uh, that's what we heard from providers and we'll continue um, in our advocacy on that front. So thank you for that question.